Pioneer brand canola with Optimum Gly, the highest yielding glyphosate tolerant trait on the market. What's next in canola happens here. Sean Haney with Real Agriculture and Real Ag Radio, Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Let's talk Canadian politics. And we're joined right now by Mr. James Moore. He is former MP and now Senior Business Advisor at Denton's Government Affairs and Public Policy Group. Uh, James, it is great to chat with you. Pleasure to be with you. Okay, so life after politics, uh, you're, you're, you've been at Denton's for quite some time. What are some of the things you're up to right now? I mean, when I left politics, I was Minister of Industry, which is to say the second largest department in the government of Canada. So I got uh, the opportunity to put my finger in a lot of things from aerospace policy to auto policy, tax policy. I chaired the Cabinet Committee on Economic Growth and, and Fiscal uh, and Economic Policy for the government of Canada. So I got to sort of sample a lot of things. And Denton's is the biggest law firm in the world. And so we get to, you know, we have clients from all over the place in the ag space and international trade, um, you know, in foreign investment coming in from around the world into Canada, trying to develop resources, build businesses. So the diversity of stuff that I got to see in government is now sort of flipped now into the private sector. And I get to experience lots of really interesting stuff, sit on a few boards as well, and uh, really enjoying the private sector and and talking to media like yourself when I want to, not just when I when I have to, because our government has done something that's uh, out, of, out of step with the public interest. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I hear you. Well, hey, we're recording this on a Monday afternoon. Parliament returned today. What do you expect out of this sitting of Parliament? Uh, I think it'll be seen as shaky by the public, right? Because the NDP and the Liberals have officially, you know, parted ways, but they're still dating, right? Um, they're, they're they're still friends with benefits, but they're not officially married in their in their contractual agreement. So uh, I think actually we will have stability because you know in the, in the Canadian system, in, in order for there to be an election in a minority parliament you know, the three out of the four parties have to want an election. And the Liberals definitely don't want an election, right? They're deep in the woods in the low 20s. Justin Trudeau is deeply unpopular. Um, the NDP have had bad numbers as well. They don't want an election as well. So that, so two out of the three needed parties of the four don't want a campaign. The Bloc Québécois can have an election anytime. They're doing well in the province of Quebec right now. They, they can go. The Conservatives really want an election. So when the when the when the spread is so wide, it's in everybody's self interest on the on the bottom end of the polling dynamic to want to sort of hold it together. So I think they'll hold it together. The big element that's going to be that's it is rocking things is the poor performance of the liberals in the by-elections in toronto uh there are two by-elections that are happening this week that are that are really going to be problematic i think for the government in terms of justin trudeau's ability to hold things together so as parliament comes back i think conservatives are in the are in you know wind full in their sails pretty cocky pretty 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 uh, you know on top of their game and ready to go um into a campaign and i think the liberals are in a turtle they had under their national caucus retreat in nanaimo last week and a third of the mps a third of the mps didn't show up uh that's staggering like that doesn't happen you're the governing party in a of a g7 country and a third of your mps don't show up to meet with the prime minister to talk about the fall strategy of parliament so this is a government that's not just deep in the back nine they're really on their on their last legs i i watched question period today and felt a little bit spicy we got some new uh nicknames of like the phantom finance minister the conservatives were calling uh, finance minister freeland the liberals were accusing the ndp of taking a hard turn to the right uh, i heard carbon tax carney yeah many times. saying a few others yeah 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 so th this is uh clearly some stakes being put in the ground what, what do you make of Mark Carney being a, a a volunteer advisor. What what do you what do you make of that? What's the strategy? I, I have two lenses I put on it. One is I, I like Mark Carney a lot. I mean, he, I, I count him as a friend. He's a very nice guy, very smart guy, very substantive person. When he was governor of the Bank of Canada, we were in government, and he was very helpful coming out of the 08 global recession. And and you know, I think being a very good steward of the Bank of Canada. On the the other lens that I put on it though is that it's a bit of a weird engagement that he has now, right? Because he's he has a bunch of engagements in the private sector. And you have an incumbent finance minister, Christia Freeland, who's not getting great reviews. 
and he is sort of an advisor to them, giving them advice. It's not known, you know, what, what conflict of interest rules that that may or may not have been exposed here because he he does work for companies that are, of whom would benefit from him being able to bend the ear of the government. He's helping the liberals, but he's not a liberal member of parliament or a minister. He's not committed to run for them in the next election, but he does want to help them. But he's still kind of an advisor to help the general public, but not just the liberal party. So he's kind of in this weird sort of half in, half out move where if things go sideways he's going to wear some of the blame but if the liberals go down maybe he's trying to he's trying to earn a little bit of credit with the incumbent liberal members of parliament and liberal partisans to say hey look when times were tough i was there i tried to help i tried to do everything i could to make sure that you know our party and our and our values were sustained but you know when when change happens change happens so anyway my turn now right so let's go you know, like you can tell he's trying to he's trying to do a bit of a parlay here right mm -hmm. so i don't know if that'll work um, I, you know, the, the net benefit for the public on the substance of the policy, I think, has yet to be seen. There won't be a budget until the spring of next year, even if Justin Trudeau is still prime minister. So I don't know. I mean, it, it's kind of a weird move, and, and it's not clear exactly what he's proposing so far. So um, it's, it's high risk for him reputationally uh, with the general public, low risk for him within the party, but net benefit for the public is pretty obscure. Yeah, and one of the things that I've been talking about to the audience here is like, it, you know, it, whatever happens, whether Prime Minister Trudeau goes down and defeat in the next election, or he decides to take the option prior to the next election, do you really want to be the next person? Like that's a tough position. It's it's sort of like you want to yeah. be the fourth owner of the golf course. And if and if you look at the situation on the conservative side of the aisle, you you don't want to be like Andrew Shear. Then they went through Aaron O'Toole. It took to Pierre Polyev to to find the leader that changed the the, the poll numbers. I, boy, it's a tough yeah. to follow. If you look through the sweep of Canadian history, it's almost never the case that the, that the successor to an existing government does really well thereafter. It almost never happens. For example, uh, uh, Jean Chrétien wins three majorities in a row. Paul Martin comes in. He wins the next election, underperforms, wins a minority. He's gone in two years. Brian Mulroney is there for eight years. He leaves. Kim Campbell comes on. She's out of office in six months, and she's gone. The party's down to two seats. Even the Conservative Party, Stephen Harper loses in 2015. We go to Rana Ambrose, Andrew Scheer, Aaron O'Toole, Pierre Polyev, and now we're up. It took four leaders. Yeah. The Liberals went from Jean Chrétien, Paul Martin, Stefan Dion, Michael Ignatieff, Bill Graham, and then they they've arrived. They arrived at Justin Trudeau, and then but you because and the reason for that is in our culture is that we have a we have a parliamentary system, but we have presidential style politics. It's very leader focused. And so the habits, especially after eight or nine years, 10 years that somebody, Justin Trudeau has been leader of the liberals now for 10 years, the habits, the values, the mores, the disposition, the identity, all of it, it and the vocabulary is becomes one and the same with the person. That, that person goes and the party doesn't know what it thinks or believes or how it should present itself anymore. And there's a bit of a scramble and a shakeup. And so after Trudeau, it's it's going to be a wild scramble, and and that that'll provide Pierre Polyev with the opportunity, should he win, to have maybe some clear sort of horizon in front of him to set some goals, move, move an agenda, and go in a certain direction. But it also means that the official opposition is probably not the Liberals. The, the official opposition becomes the provinces, it becomes the yeah. cities, it becomes the media, it becomes expectations, it becomes uh, the growing dynamic in Quebec right now, which we can talk about, about the rise of Quebec separatism that's happening quietly in Quebec. Yeah, I heard that today in question period, you know, uh, that, that 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 was actually really clear today, is talking about the, the rise of Quebec and some of the attitude coming from the, the, the block. But I, I want to talk about the 17 to 20 point lead that the conservatives have right now, depending on which poll you, you look at, is it, is that insurmountable? Is this a foregone conclusion that Pierre Polyev is the next prime minister, or is there something the liberals can do to at least close that gap between now and whenever the next election is? Well, Donald Trump will never become president. Hillary Clinton can't lose. She's so far <laughs> ahead in the polls. You know, <laughs> so, I mean, uh, good yeah. Point. Good point. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I, like, you know, you never say never. Um, however, with this, I, I think we're pretty close to saying never. In, in, in part because I, I use the, the example of Trump and, Clinton, and Hillary Clinton. So people knew Hillary Clinton. They didn't know Donald Trump. In this circumstance, you know, Pierre Polyev, what's interesting, most interesting about the conservative numbers now is that there's a consensus between 10 and 20 points he's been up now. Um, let's say 15. For a year, historically, when the liberals have gotten in trouble and the conservatives pop up in the polls, the public go, I can't believe this. I don't like this. we got to get rid of the liberals. Give us the other guys. And they look at the other guys and they go, 
yeah, I don't know if I want the other guys. I'm still mad at the liberals, but I don't know about the other guys. And so that's happened. I mean, conservatives under both Andrew Scheer and Aaron O'Toole won the popular vote, but lost the seat count. What's, what's interesting now about the poll numbers is that the public says they want change. But in order to win government, the public has to want the other people to win. They have to want the other guy. And that's that has been lacking. So now the liberals, the public doesn't want them. They are they think that the conservatives are ready and they expect the conservatives to win. Right. So so I think the, the one, two, three combo of we want the current guys out. We want the other guys in and we think the other guys are going to win. And we're OK with that. For a year now, more than a year, Pierre has been 10 to 20 points up in the polls, and it hasn't spooked the voters into thinking, well, I don't know if we have sort of early buyer's remorse about what we're signaling here. They're actually quite comfortable. They're ready for change. And what's most interesting, if you go the next layer down in the numbers, is that the cohort of voters that are leading the change are young Canadians. It's not it's not gray hair, senior citizens, sort of people who are culturally more you know prepared for you know, center right governments because of the, you know, historical alignment. No, it's young people. The biggest cohort, the biggest voting block and conservatives would win a super majority if only people who are, who are 18 to 35 voted, then conservatives lead that cohort of voters more than any other group of voters, which that's, has that, never happened before in my lifetime. That's incredible. You know, considering that probably there's a, a, a good pack of those that, you know, in that Harper versus Trudeau round one, when uh, Trudeau yeah. won to become a prime minister, the, the legalization of cannabis w- was a big issue in that election. They're, they're, they've they've switched teams, so to speak. Well, yes, and you know it's been ten years, right? We're coming up on ten years of Justin Trudeau now being prime minister. I mean, fifteen, so nine, but you get my point. What have you um, done lately? Right. Yeah. But also, you know, 18 to 28, they're 28. There's a whole new group of people. When Justin Trudeau was first elected prime minister, there were people who are 11 years old, 10 years old, who can now vote. And they don't know any of that stuff. They don't know Harper, who he was or what he was, or let alone Mulroney or Critchett. All they know is they see Justin Trudeau. And there are a lot of young Canadians who just say, you know, I mean, you know, I know it's become a cliched word, but the woke stuff or the like pe- people assuming that young people's their first obsession is culture wars and social policy and climate change. You know, young people care about those issues and they want to live in a decent society where we're all thoughtful and careful about each other and, and respectful of our differences. Yes, they care about climate change, but you know what? I'd kind of like to own a house. And, yeah. you know, I, I do have an entrepreneurial spirit. I'm I'm 20 and I'm going to be working for the next 40 years. And I just I don't want to just settle down in a career. I want to rise and grind and fight and push and have success and have failure. And I want to either own a farm or I want to build a small business or I want to try something. And and I want to go and I want low taxes and I want to be able to have a house and I, like and and when I'm working and when I get up in the when I get up in the morning and it's dark and I'm scraping the ice off my windshield and I drive to work in the dark and I put in a full days of work and I drive home from work in the dark and put a, have a shower at the end of my day and at the start of my day and I kick off my boots and, and warm up a can of soup and sit in front of my TV, I don't like people laughing at me and making fun of me because I. I, I, I'm a religious person or I have certain values or I believe in entrepreneurship and I don't like high taxes and I don't want my house broken into when I leave my home in the day. So, you know, Pierre is the only guy who speaks to them. And so there's, there, there's a, there's a center right entrepreneurial sort of recalibration with young Canadians that's going on and you see it in the numbers everywhere. It's, yeah. and I mean, I got I mean, yes, I'm a conservative and all that, but I think it's, I think it's really refreshing because like we've, we've, we've had this sort of meme about young people for a long time that they're, you know, entitled and lazy and weak and soft and and all that. No, young Canadians are are aggressive and forward leaning, and they want to succeed, and they're not victims, and they want to fight and and push. And it's it's great to see. The, the other recalibration that's happening is, you know, I'm used to the NDP courting the union vote. I'm used to liberals courting the union vote. Yeah. What's up with the conservatives courting the union vote? What what's at play here? So I live in British Columbia, and so I, I was active in politics as a young volunteer in the 90s. I was elected from 2000 to 2015. In that time frame, there were always people in British Columbia, and, and you, they, they exist in Saskatchewan, Manitoba as well, less so in Alberta, people who vote provincially for the New Democrats and vote federally for the Reform Party and the, and the old Conservative Party. And they, they we know that they existed on paper, but you could never actually find them and meet them and shake their hand and say, what is going on in your head? Like, who, who, what's going on? But, you know, but but they exist like they are there. And these are people who believe in the value of collective bargaining. They want to make sure that they get a good day's wage and a good day's pay for a good day's work. And they want to be treated equally and they want to be treated fairly. And they do believe that that, you know, we should have social systems out there for seniors as we all get older. And we we worry about our parents and all that. They do believe in all that stuff. 
Um, but they see the current sort of new Democrat progressive universe, not talking about those things, about being there for the little guy and instead talking more like, you know, on a random day, if you turn on question period and you watch the federal NDP and Jagmeet Singh, you would think the three biggest issues facing the planet are climate change, um, gender identity and Aboriginal indigenous reconciliation. Important issues for sure for a lot of people, but those are not the one, two, three on most people's minds. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of, again, particularly private sector union people in, in Western Canada that I know, uh, they just don't, they just said, that's not my party. And so like we have an election coming up in British Columbia here, the campaign starts in a couple of yep. weeks. There are a lot of people, I know a lot of people who traditionally vote um, federally conservative, who who are really comfortable with the NDP. And they may not be comfortable with David Eby, the incumbent premier, and they now have a provincial conservative party to vote for. But but they're, they've not been offended by the NDP, at least in the past 10 years, um, because they sort of speak for, have been seen to be speaking for the little guy. And conservatives have noticed that, Pierre Poilievre has noticed that, and he's, and he's making a real pitch for those people. So how does he work in, how does he walk into corporate Canada? And you're, 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 you're kind of, those are two sides of the equation. You're court and the union vote, but you're also, are they pro-business? I mean, it's funny, people have this meme about, again, about conservatives, right? That were, you know, pinstripe suits and Gucci, Gucci, Gucci loafers and all that. And it's not, that's not the conservative world. In fact, if you look at former conservative cabinet ministers who worked with Stephen Harper, like myself, like, yeah, some of us work in corporate Canada and we have, you know, th those sort of connections, but you know, we, we were not ever the darlings of corporate Canada. Like that, that that's, that's where federal liberals are. Right. Um, and that's, that's not the vote that Pierre is going after. Now, should Pierre become prime minister? Obviously, he understands his obligation and responsibility to work with people who are making investments in Canada, who are employing Canadians, who are drawing in, uh, you know, enormous capital and wealth and talent into Canada for 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 benefit and all that. Uh, but that's not really where votes are. So he he will have, a, I think, a healthy balance of a relationship between sort of corporate Canada broadly and sort of everyday Canadians. But you'll notice, like he. You know, unless he's in the House of Commons or at some kind of a formal occasion that that demands the the attire, Pierre is he's kind of a regular guy who wears golf shirts, t shirts, jeans, khakis, and like he's just a normal guy. He's not actually comfortable wearing a suit all the time. He he dresses and is kind of like the voter that he aspires to represent. And it's not a game, and it's not some you know uh, you know PR stunt or, or or sort of mirroring gimmick. Like the, he is just kind of that normal guy like that. And corporate Canada, you know, broadly speaking, is, uh, you know, for sure a relationship that he'll he'll have to maintain, but it's not the emphasis of his of his platform. What do you think they're going to be like, they would be like if they do become government? What do you think they'll be like on trade? That That's the one, that's the piece that it, yeah. not a lot of talk about it, like it doesn't win elections, but it's really important to the Canadian economy. And he potentially is going to have to review be a part of a renegotiation yeah. of the kuzma usmca agreement this is important stuff what, what does that look like yeah i mean there, there are certain issues where whether you're on the blue team red team orange team green team it doesn't matter there's just fundamental relationships that have to be tendered attended to if, if you're the prime minister of the country the 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 ottawa quebec relationship is is unique and special and important the indigenous relationship is really important and the canada u.s relationship is is really fundamental it's about one in four one in five canadian jobs is dependent on trade with the united states and we came very close to donald trump i mean he was genuinely threatening to abrogate nafta during the nafta renegotiations of 2017 to 2019 i was a member of the nafta council with with minister freeland as, as part of the group that was negotiating on behalf of canada and advising the government in those negotiations and i can tell you that was a genuine and real threat between donald trump and bernie sanders combined in the 2016 primary and even into the 2020 primaries um, about two out of three Americans voted for candidates, Trump and Sanders. Two thirds of Americans voted for candidates who wanted to repeal NAFTA and put in something quotes new and different. And that's really dangerous and risky for Canada because you know the weight of the importance of this relationship with the United States is so fundamental in the ag space, in the auto space, manufacturing jobs, IT. Uh, you know, it's it's really critical and, and fundamental. We have access to that market. So yeah, Pierre Polyev becomes prime minister. The, the the agreement that was reached requires renegotiation and and revisiting in two thousand and twenty six. Um, and if we don't have a new agreement that's signed and delivered uh, that renews it for a, a fixed term of some kind, maybe another ten years or hopefully longer than that, then it goes to an annual agreement that gets rolled. It has to get reconsidered every year on an annual basis thereafter. Well, you can imagine the chilling effect that that would have on on long term investments into Canada. People are choosing between 
you know, a corporate tax rate in the United States that's significantly lower than what's on offer in Canada and a dollar uh, and, and purchasing power of the consumer in the United States versus Canada. When you look at the per capita GDP strength of the U.S. over Canada, it's a really important relationship and a really important um, policy obstacle for, for PR to manage. Yeah, you, you look at the Chinese China EVs, right? We got the Liberals applying the hundred percent tariff. The Conservatives were right, lock and step. It, there, there's there's some similarities there, which is is similar south of the border where we see Dems and Republicans talking the same tariff mantra, right? So, yeah, it, that that was a bit of a bank shot, right? That was that was a way of the Liberals smartly and the Conservatives smartly aligning Canada's policies with the United States, right? So so the idea of having like. Put it this way, the Canada-US-Mexico combined, but particularly the Canada-US part, but NAFTA together is the most successful, lucrative, and job-producing, wealth-creating economic relationship in the history of the world. To protect that NAFTA partnership between us and the United States and Mexico, to keep it going, um, we have to be very careful about other trade relationships like China and what that does to threaten the confidence of people in the NAFTA partnership. So... If China is, is able to import EVs into Canada, we take them in and then export them into the United States because of NAFTA, that threatens NAFTA. Whatever we get in terms of value from the China relationship on EVs is doesn't come anywhere close if you're going to risk the bigger relationship. And Mexico is playing a very dangerous game right now because there are massive greenfield investments into Mexico right along the U.S.-Mexico border uh, that are causing a lot of Americans to be very anxious about the future of the NAFTA partnership because of Mexico. So the U.S.-Mexico relationship is a really important relationship that Canada keep an eye on because that could break, in which case the bilateral, trilateral relationship between all three parties and then Canada and the U.S. becomes challenged because it's not just immigration. And if there, yes, there's a racial and, and you know political component to it that gets torqued times 10 in U.S. politics, but there's also a sub substantive um, economic piece of it where China is investing massively into Mexico and those goods and products are finding their way across the U.S. border and being called NAFTA inclusive, and that that threatens yeah. the the value of NAFTA in the eyes of Americans. Yeah, a great example of nearshoring that China is is executing on. Um, okay, so I, I'm I agree, I'm right there with you, but that does that not mean that in the next Canadian election we have to have, be having a serious discussion about military spending, and especially particular to our two percent commitment to NATO. Yeah, it will be part of it, but but I it's interesting when you look again at the polls and you ask Canadians. There was a great one that was actually just done. I was looking at it for a presentation I'm doing uh, the, later this week in Montreal about uh, Canadians are asked they're they're given a list of like 30 issues, and you can you can choose three your top three issues that you want the next government to focus on. And military spending doesn't really come in there. Um, Donald Trump, should he become president of the United States again, he will he will emphasize that. Uh, and that will be a challenge for Canada because 2% of GDP, I mean, that's an extra $20, $30 billion spend on military procurement above what is currently scheduled. And that's a massive expectation given those the deficits that we have and the debt load that we have. Um, what that can be spent on that would be accretive to Canada economically, but would contribute to our national security obligations under Five Eyes, partnership with the U.S. and all that. There are things that we can spend it on. You think about aerial surveillance in the north, search and rescue capacity in the north because of climate change and what's happening up there, border security stuff. Like you want to do, in my view, you want to do as many things that are uniquely beneficial to Canada, but also hint at a partnership with the United States in the long term about continental security. So you kind of want to do a one-two punch where you 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 spend on military for in ways that have Canadian taxpayers being on side, but also allow you that added benefit of Americans saying those the, the Canadians up north, we we can trust the Canucks. They're our friends, they're our allies, and they're working with us to keep an eye on what's happening in the far north and and doing what they can in terms of being a good faithful partner of NATO. Okay, before I let you go, uh, I'll get I'll ask you the question that probably everybody asks. Uh, prediction: yeah. When do we get an election? I my I'll, I'll I'll do better than that. My my best guess is Justin Trudeau will not run again in the next campaign. My guess is he will probably step down, but probably around Christmas. I'm guessing, but we'll see how the by elections go. I think there will be a liberal leadership. There will be a budget in the spring and a vote probably in June of next year. There you heard it. We've been talking to James Moore. He is with Denton's. James, it's been great to chat with you. Really do appreciate it, and I hope we can do it again soon. Anytime. Pleasure's mine. Yeah.